Timothy chapter 2. We're going through the Bible verse by verse. This is where we land today. A uh, little bit of the backdrop here. The Apostle Paul is writing to his successor, his protege, Timothy. He's telling him how to do church. And he said, look, you know, is there isn't any manual out yet. Uh, um, you know, much of the teaching was out of the Old Testament at the time, and uh, the New Testament is, is being developed. And so Paul, essentially Paul here in this particular uh, chapter is saying, listen, don't adulterate the Word of God, you know, just to be popular, to make it acceptable. We don't need that, you know. Give them the Word. Give them what they need. So that's the, the essence of the, the flow of thought here from Paul. Let's take a look here at verse 11. We'll pick it up there. Uh, he goes on to say this after so much about, you know, being faithful to the Word. This is a faithful saying. For if we die with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, if not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of hearers, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more and more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are, are of this sort. These two guys were saying that the resurrection was already past. It was not a bodily resurrection. Uh, resurrection but a spiritual resurrection, but that is, it's essential for us to know that it was a bodily resurrection. Why? Because you're the body of Christ. I mean, God's telling us something here, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, he goes on and he says, verse 18, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. Never will... The, 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 the solid... There we go. It turned off right in my pocket. Be right with you. It's all vibrant. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, that is a first for me. That's one talented lady I've got. So anyway, so where were we? Yeah, 18. So who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some? Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in, the, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for dishonor, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who will call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. All right, that's a large chunk of change there. I'm going to try and unpack it. We may revisit some of this next week. But remember, we were talking about last week about don't adulterate the Word of God. This is such a central theme in the, uh, in the epistles, especially this one. I want you, I'm going to read a quote from A.W. Tozer about this whole concept from 1960, all right? The crowds at any price mania has taken a firm grip on American Christianity. This is 1960. It's a lot worse now. Compete, uh, American Christianity. Men and churches compete for the attention of the paying multitude who are brought in by means of any currently popular gimmick to have their souls saved, but off 
often for reasons not so praiseworthy. They who degrade or compromise God's truth in order to reach larger numbers dishonor God and deeply injure the souls of men. And I amen to that part of it. The temptation to modify the teachings of Christ with the hope that larger num numbers will accept him, and that is cruelly strong in this day of speed, size, noise, and crowds. But if we know what is good for us, we will resist it with every power in our command. I want you to think about this. You have, let's put two prophets in the Old Testament next to one another, side by side, Jonah and Jeremiah, right? Both of these men <clears throat> just preached God's message, you know? Jeremiah was faithful to that call. And there wasn't one convert in Israel in 40 years of ministry. Not one. His heart was right. He wept over his country. But there wasn't any outward success. Jonah comes along, hated his enemies. He wanted them to be judged by God. God had to stick him in a well. It had to experience hell for three days and three nights. Then he gets delivered and he says, essentially, turn or burn. Repent, 40 days there's judgment. That was an act of love by God, an act of obligation by Jonah, coerced by God. And the whole city gets saved. <coughs> Demonstrating the power of God. It is God and God alone who saves the human soul. And that we are to preach the word faithfully, whether there seems to be results or not. And not just in churches, but with one another, with our families, with our friends. Just be faithful to the word. And so, I want to remind you, we are not diplomats. We are prophets in that sense. And our message is not compromise. Our message is an ultimatum. You will spend eternity in one of two places. It is a fact. And don't worry about how people respond. You know how much mocking and jeering and argumentative attitude I've received just by telling somebody believe in hell when they come up and ask me, and then they assault me. They assault me, verbally, of course, or, uh, except for the one time Tara stabbed me, but that's another story. <laughs> I want to tell you that a hundred religious people carefully organized does not constitute a church. Any more than 11 dead men constitute a football team. See? A hundred pianos tuned to the same fork, tuning fork, are automatically tuned to each other. They are of one accord, bowing to the original standard, that tuning fork. So that when we come in tuned to the standard, Jesus Christ, and every one of us, uh, we come that way, and, uh, um, uh, we are nearer in our heart to one another than we could possibly be if we just decided to be a unity. You know what I'm saying? Our unity lies in our being tuned to the same source. All the other, you, you take a hundred pianos, tune them to the same thing, they, they, they rise in harmony. One note produces the, the other ones respond to that note. We're responding to the one note. That's where unity is in, 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 our, in our churches and among us. We have, we have very different people in here, very different from one another. Very strange, very odd, and, uh, and, uh, and, but we have the one thing in common. We're tuned to the same fork, you see, and, and this, in spite of our differences. Uh, you know, remember, Jesus called himself the matter from heaven, the bread of life. And I want to remind you that, that a person is made of what he feeds upon, you see. And if you don't feed upon this word all throughout the week, if you don't do that, if you don't worship God all seven days of the week, you're not worshiping at all. You're not worshiping at all. Every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. Understand what I'm saying? Everyone is a missionary or an imposter. Open your mouth and speak and let people, you know, care more about eternal souls than your feelings being hurt or your reputation being diminished in some way. Martin Luther, he says, Scripture is the cradle in which Christ lies. As a mother goes to the cradle to find the baby, we go to the Bible to find Jesus. So the Bible is a portrait of Jesus Christ. We know that, right? He says, it all speaks of me. 
It all speaks of me. And so our yearning to know the incomprehensible, the infinite, arises, arises from the image of God that he's placed in man. And you know that deep calleth unto deep. And David says that in the Psalms, deep calleth unto deep. Here we are, and we have this deep in us that longs for a soul-satisfying experience. And the only thing that fulfills that is the great, great deep of the sovereign grace and mercy of God. Deep calls unto deep. You come here with questions. You're filled with concerns. It's deep. You know, the, the, there's nothing wider than the capability of a human soul. There's nothing wider, not even the, wider than space because we're made in the image of God who created the universe. And I don't think people contemplate these things from time to time, you see? And so the image of God and man calls unto God. The soul senses its origin and longs to return to its source. That's what's happening in your souls right now as you come hungry for the things of God. And Psalm 97, um, <clears throat> Psalm 97, there's a, there's a place there where it says in um, verse 11, listen to this, uh, light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. We, we see him describing God as a sower. A sower of himself. And he, he, he's throwing light into the world. Think about how he made the stars. He spoke it had just like sprinkling seed across the sky. To tell the, the inhabitants of earth, I am. I'm real. I exist. And that's what God does. Uh, Psalm 19 talks about, uh, you know, all of creation crying out. The heavens declare the glory of God. And so the sun like a sower scatters light on the earth like seeds. Spurgeon says this, the night sky filled with stars looks like God scattered them like gold dust upon the floor of heaven. Spurgeon was very poetic and he smoked cigars. Just say. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, Spurgeon didn't like Christmas. Christmas was a fairly new idea at that time, and he kind of like, yeah, we should worship God all the time. So, he smokes a cigar and doesn't like Christmas. That's all you need to know to go out in the world uh, today. But the, the, the idea of sowing light signifies first that light has to be diffused. And you see, we see here a picture of God diffusing his joy and his gladness and his happiness constantly into our souls. Constantly. Constantly in our souls. And thank God he hasn't kept his happiness to himself. And that seed, that word that God is sowing right now, produces a harvest, produces fruit. And then finally, God sowed himself into the world at Christmas time. God sows light into us through his word and the Holy Spirit. He's constantly sowing that light into us. And so I want to look now at the amen of that light, who is Jesus Christ. Take a look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, very quickly. He writes to Laodicea, it's a lukewarm church. He says, verse 13, the 13, he who, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God is Jesus Christ. The Amen of God. Amen signifies true, just, faithful, certain that Jesus Christ is God's final Amen, His ultimate Amen, His ultimate so be it, calling Himself the Amen of God. He is the Amen to all of the Old Testament stories, the types, the metaphors, the altar, the blood, the robes, all these things, these images, these pictures, these shadows of the ultimate reality, needed a soul put into it, needed the amen of God to give it force and meaning and substance. It is finished, the amen of God. He came to fulfill the law, not to obliterate it. He said, it's finished. Jesus, the Amen of God, finished all the types and shadows of the ceremonial law, and it was there on Calvary that Jesus gave the ultimate Amen to all of God's plans and promises, 
that was there that the law seemed to say there about Calvary that the sinner is to be despised and rejected. He is a shameful thing on the earth. He is to be spit upon, beaten, and crowned with thorns. And what does God say to that through the law? Jesus comes, the amen of God, it is finished, done. Your salvation is a fact. It is a promise from God who cannot lie. And uh, you know, people say, well, you know, you might be a little sloppy in your living. Not if you understand it. You will respond to God out of gratitude instead of obligation. That's Christianity, not doing good things necessarily. So he sent his own son to pay the price. And then I want you to see this in Revelation uh, uh, chapter 7. And let me read this for you. Revelation chapter 7. He talks, about the, he talks about the resurrection and all these things. We did a memorial service for Tom yesterday and I shared this, so be patient those of you that were there, please. The Apostle John is, is taking, uh, given these visions of heaven. He says this, After these things I looked and behold a great number, which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, uh, uh, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and honor and, and, and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be to God forever and ever. And remember, Paul has got, just gotten finished talking to uh, Timothy about, about the resurrection. He, he, it's a bodily resurrection, he says. And here is a picture from God. At the center of the universe is the throne of God and the Lamb, the sin bearer, right next to the throne of God. As if, and I'm not saying this is a doctor, but as if the unveiled glory and beauty of God just by himself is too much for eternal spirits to bear. And so to make mankind not to spare, he shows this substitutionary Lamb, who is a man, who is God, there to, to tell, yes, God is powerful, but he died for you. And then they say, he's in all power, all honor. Hallelujah chorus. That's from Revelation 19. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. You know, when Handel wrote that and he first had it performed in front of the king of England, it was very inappropriate for the king to stand up from his throne or to really show any emotion. He sobbed. And he stood up, breaking all protocol, and he said, let us believe that our God has just entered the room. That's what we do when we come here. One, one focus, one goal, tuned to the right place, the substitute. And then I want you to see that we're going to be right there at the foot of the very throne of God, not in the bleacher seats, not in the outer courts, but right there. A multitude incapable of being numbered by any human being. And, and a, a part of that I want you to see is this. That God is social. He's very social. He is a family. He's a community. He's Father, Son, Spirit. And he chose not to be alone in, in any other sense. He made people to associate with, to talk, to, to dance, to eat, to drink with. To laugh with the sin. Jesus had a good time when he went to parties. The, the sinners loved him. The people that didn't like him were the self-righteous. They were the religious. You know? There's so much self-righteousness today. We should be the least self-righteous people on the planet. The least. And I want you to see they were clothed in white robes. We will be clothed with the righteousness of God. Not our own righteousness. It's not acceptable. And I want you to think about this scene. 
our naked God, our naked Savior, clothed our nakedness with himself. Friend, what are you doing here? Why aren't you wearing the robes that the king has provided for you? No, 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 get out. You stand before God and he says something to you like this. Well, how should I, why should I let you in? And you say anything like, um, well, I was a good person and tried to do the Ten Commandments. You're doomed. You're doomed. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have it, and has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. And I want to tell you this, you are married to God if you're a Christian. Let no man separate what God himself has joined together. It is impossible for you to be separated from Jesus Christ. He's your groom. And the Bible begins with a wedding and ends with a wedding. And that last wedding is the marriage feast of the Lamb, you see. And so the, the resurrection uh, validates the claim of Jesus Christ, his claims of deity, that's why it's so important, and, and his claim of all authority. I, I want you to remember uh, Mar Mary Magdalene. Remember, he's risen from the dead. John chapter 20, verse 15. I want to read this for you. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She returned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but to go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and Father. Mary Magdalene came and she told the disciples about this. But what I want you to see is this. If you say something to yourself like this, I want to become a Christian, but I'm not ready yet. What you're saying to yourself is, I think I can be ready to be a Christian. I think I can do something to make myself ready to be a Christian. You will never be ready to be a Christian. Today is the day of your salvation. Do not turn a deaf ear to your maker's voice. Today's the day. You'll never be ready. I want you to consider this too. Believe salvation with all your heart. Remember who Mary Magdalene was. She was previously demon-possessed. Previously demon-possessed. Seven demons. And yet we see her in the garden grabbing probably maybe the foot of God. I don't know. Some people say she was about 10 years old at the time. She was born in a town called Magdala. Uh, this woman who would never be accepted in society, not to mention especially the re religious community. Look at this picture. Here she's embracing God himself. And there's no word of condemnation. Now, what makes the difference between her and a religious person? She believed in the grace of Jesus Christ. They did not. It is the dividing line down through human history and the, the world's population today. <clears throat> no religious Jew would have allowed uh, her to touch them. Uh, they were very familiar with the holiness and unapproachableness of God in the Old Testament so that even to touch the foot of Sinai, when the law was being given, the mountain of God was met with death. Here, this previously demon possessed woman is completely embraced by a resurrected God. Now he says this, we need to endure. That was in the passage too, remember that? We need to endure. Two verses from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every way, and the sin which is so uh, and the sin which is so easily ensnares us. So let us run uh, with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the Author and the Finisher of our faith, and uh, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
What are the rules for our race? How do we endure? This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. We each have an appointed course that God has laid out for us. Mine is different from yours. My trials are different than your trials. My heartaches are different than your heartaches. I don't want your storm. I got my storm. And you don't want my storm because it's not your storm. And I just forgot where I was going with this. I'll leave it alone. But you know, but this is what he's saying. He's saying, lay aside anything that slows you down. Think just that. I'm not trying to bust anybody here, but I think it merits. We waste a lot of time. You gotta admit that. We most of us do. Unless you're a single mother of three, uh, then you probably need some sedatives and a taser gun. But beside that, I know it keeps you very busy when that's going on. But but just consider the brevity of this life and how much time we waste, you know? And, 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 and that's, that's a hindrance. That's a hindrance. Lay aside the false idols and worry. And, and, and think about this. How do we even begin this race? What does God say? Look to the one who began your race. Uh, look to the one who finishes your race. You see? And what do you do? You gaze on the tuning fork. Never take your eyes off of it. If you shift your goals in life, you're going to run crooked. You keep your eye on the prize and you just keep going. And that's like, is that not a constant exercise in our lives? Constantly keeping him in our scope. And, and so we're to run with endurance, with patience, with love, with, with uh, long suffering, uh, running this God appointed, appointed course, humility, love, forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is a form of suffering. Jesus showed us that on the cross. It hurts to forgive people. You have to sacrifice something of yourself. And we are called to focus on, on Jesus in all those areas. And if we shift our eyes, we don't run straight. So just run a direct line to that focus in here. Keep your eye on the only immovable goal in the universe because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. amen. I had to give myself an amen there because I was feeling pretty rowdy. But anyway. And so other than Jesus, mankind has his eyes fixed on ever-changing goals. Don't you think about the shifting goals in life of most people that don't know Jesus? Constantly reinventing themselves, right? If you're a little boy, when I was a little boy, I remember when I went out trick-or-treating and Davy Crockett was a, was a big thing back then. Some of you are millennials are thinking, what in the name of God is a Davy Crockett? He had a rat raccoon hat. He was, a, you know, he was a pioneersman and a frontiersman and everything. And it was everything to me to become Davy Crockett. I even had a Johnny Rebel cannon later on. It shot a plastic cannonball. And so you keep shifting, you know. Now I'm the sexiest man on the planet. <laughs> uh, but, but, but the world, you know, and then you grow up, you want to be an athlete or a, you know, a gamer or a cheerleader, mom, dad, businessman, it goes on. Constantly shifting goals. Constantly trying to shape your identity through outward things. You see? No. You're a child of God. That's all you'll ever be. And you, you, you can't get any better than that. You're God's child. You see? And so... Uh, the people running through life crookedly, you know, we spend our entire lives trying to get God in focus. So we're called to fix our eyes on both the starter of our race and the finisher of our race. And he says, off look unto it. It's the idea of take everything out of your focus. And there's a, a, a certain power in the off uh, look word here in Greek. It's the idea of stop looking at all these uh, non-essential things and focus on the one ultimate thing, Jesus Christ. But it means to go deep into, it means to look into Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing now. We're looking into our Savior's heart, you see? And so he's the finisher of our faith. So we start with a suffering, dying Savior. That's how we start our faith, right? And we end with him at the right hand of God in the throne of glory. That's quite a race. It, 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 it beats a gold medal. <laughs> you know what I mean? We get God. We get God. You know, we ask for things from God and he doesn't give us that. We get disappointed. What he's doing is giving you himself. 
And what else is there? He is existence itself. He said, I am. I am being itself. I am life itself. And so the eyes of Christ, David said, you will guide me by your eyes, Lord. The eyes of Christ are to us as the stars were to the ancient uh, mariners as they tried to navigate this path in life. And he draws us up to himself, this, 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 this great magnet above, one of the old theologians said, drawing us towards itself. And here we're called to copy Jesus' endurance, his love, his patience, his forgiveness. He bore it all until he said, it is finished. And I want to tell you something, uh, shame is a great assault on the human soul, and Jesus showed us how to bear it, who, for the joy set before him, he endured the shame. It surpasses human thought. Jesus hung a naked Savior, clothing a naked race. The weary one who clothed the flowers of the field, he hung naked himself. Now, and he says this, confess in verse 12. Confess, open your mouth, open your mouth. Now I want you to know it doesn't say profess. A lot of people profess, but confession is completely a different. Confess, Pro profess is easy. <coughs> confess implies it is a, a deed of courage, exposing the one who is confessing to danger, to humility and rejection. The confessor accepts the suffering and the shame. You are going to be assaulted. You are going to be humiliated. It's what people do. How many of you, don't raise your hands please. <laughs> ah, that means I probably shouldn't say it. Let me think. <laughs> Chris, uh, Thanksgiving, when you go to the family uh, gathering at Thanksgiving, how many of you have to, are drawn into a difficult conversation with family members who disagree with you about spiritual things, right? It's a battle. Don't be ashamed. I always tell people, I always say, listen, ask somebody why they don't believe. Don't argue. You don't have to argue with them, but make them think. Because that's what they're doing. They're not thinking. They don't want to think about it. You see, they, they just don't want to. Um, and so what he's saying here is you, you, I, 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 there's vessels for honor and dishonor. Take this word. Do not adulterate it. Confess it. Focus on it. Look into Jesus Christ and it will make you a vessel of honor. It will sanctify you. Jesus said, John 17, Father, sanctify them by thy word. Right? It is of the greatest importance that our desire to enjoy God is surpassed by our desire for God to make us holy. It is of the greatest importance that our desire to enjoy God is surpassed by our desire for God to make us holy. Real growth is expressed when a person desires to see the honor of God advanced through his life, even if it means he himself must suffer temporary dishonor or loss, when we can pray, hallowed be thy name, and silently add, at any cost of me, Lord, we're beginning to get it. We're beginning to get it. That's holiness. Holiness is right desires. Holiness is God making my desires like his desires. When he says, I will give you the desires of your heart, that's after he has worked in you proper desires. And people come to me all the time and say, I oh, yes, God says, he didn't give it to us, he must not exist. God doesn't exist to be your, your butler. You don't ask Almighty God to be your assistant in your agendas and plans of life. That's, that's a professor, that's not a confessor. There's a lot of professors out there. A lot of professors out there. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to rip a cross off somebody's neck because they were acting like a jackass. <laughs> Don't do, yeah, I, I've actually told people, do not come here. Do not come here because, you know, you're deceived. You, you think this is a game. You think this is something to advance yourself. 
We're all going to stand before God one day. Very soon, some of us way sooner than others. You know, is there no fear of that? Why would you use God to promote your agenda? And so the reason so many people are still troubled who say they're Christians, and they're still seeking, and still making little advance, it is often because they have not yet come to the end of themselves. And they're still trying to give God orders and interfering with God's work within them. You see? And so, the world, we are told, is spiritually dead. That when we were dead, dead, dead in trespasses and sin, in other words, completely spiritually incapable of responding to God appropriately in any way, God died for us and made us alive in Christ and seated us with Christ in heavenly places. Now, what, it, what it is to be spiritually dead, we know what it is for the body to be spiritually dead. The soul has departed and has left the body and it has in, it left the body incapacitated and unable to preserve itself. The soul that was like salt to the body, and the soul being gone from the body, the body only putrefied. You see? To be spiritually dead leaves the soul putrefied. It is a terrifying thing to see a person so morally dead. And if you want to see a person that is so intensely mor morally dead, just look at human history. How could any human being made in the image of God behave himself like Adolf Hitler, Genghis Khan. You, you're seeing humanity completely dead spirits when you see a serial killer. We will carry out Satan's evilest plans. Things that don't even seem possible when we aren't given the Christ, given the right situation. You know, we need to know that about ourselves. It, it, such a man is blind to his purpose in life. He's blind to the fact that he who made all things should be served by those he made, and that he who sustains all things should be honored by those creatures who own their continued existence to him. Men run after fading shadows and ignore the substance that they point to, God himself, and to the solid joys and eternal pleasures of his eternal world which we were made for. If they pray at all, they pray without heart, like kneeling corpses. This book opens to us immortality and eternal love, and yet the natural man is unmoved by it because he is dead. God has to stamp out sin from his universe. Desires. Let me read this for you. Shared this Wednesday night. This is Psalm 10, verse 17. Pray for justice. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. Be wrapping up soon. God is a mind reader. He knows every hair on your head. He knows what you need before you ask for it. We know that. Prayer is a desire. It's a motion of the heart towards good things. And the Lord hears it because desire is the essence of prayer. Desire is the life force of prayer. Words are but the habitation of prayer. The living tenet is desire. And hearts break so quietly, they fear so quietly, and yet God hears it and he knows, listen, he wants you to know, I've already done something about it. I am the beginning of your race, and I am the end of your race. And what is your goal? At first you start with suffering, at the end you wind up the right hand of the throne of power, the center of the universe. Silent prayer will not meet with a silent God. Our desires have voices of their own, and they knock on heaven's door, and it is open to them. I want you to remember this too. He says, God hears the prayers of the humble. I want you to know that humility is the child of the gospel and it is raised upon the knees of grace. Humility is the child of the gospel and is raised upon the knees of grace. 
To God there is music in a groan. There's beauty in a tear. So if your heart is hurting this morning, God's already done something about it. You want something, he wants to give you himself. It's always a far better thing. We ask for healing, John 11. He doesn't give it. He gives a resurrection instead. He always over answers your prayer in a perfect way. And he says here, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You see, God in his great grace prepares our hearts in such a way to produce desires aligned with him. Someone once said, prayer with heart is the heart of prayer. The cry of our soul is the soul of our cry. And if there's no heart in your prayer, if there's no soul in your prayer, you're wasting your time. You can pray a thousand times and never really pray. He's after the heart. Remember Jesus said, uh, you know, uh, you, you worship God, it, it, you know, it, in total hypocrisy. It, with your lips you, you uh, praise God, with, with your heart you are far from Him. Far from Him. He's always about heart. Words are the luggage of prayer. Language is, at best, is but the flesh. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, which prayer is embodied. And so God even prepares your heart for how to pray to him. And the word instructs you on how to pray and why you should pray to him. And it says you will prepare their hearts. God prepares our hearts to pray. And then he prepares us to respond to the great giving of the blessing that he gives you. You see, I guarantee you that Jonah, when he was in the belly of the fish, that was the best prayer he ever prayed. <laughs> All eloquence went out the window, right? It's like when you really need prayer, you're like, oh, you know, hey, you know, that's the way it is. Peter singing, hip, you know, you didn't hear all these long, you know, hundred dollar words. So, you, you know, he says, I'm going to prepare your hearts to pray. And I'll prepare, uh, I, I will make myself hear you. I prepare you to receive the blessings that comes from it. Uh, uh, he's trying, hey, listen, would you promise your child something and then withdraw it from him to crush his little heart? If God makes you promises, that means he's going to fulfill those promises. You don't go up to your child, and we're evil parents, right? We know we're evil, very evil. Some of you are just wicked. And, uh, and, 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 and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to go to Disney World. And then say, ah, it's just full. You know? Well, what God promises us. Eternity, love, glory, beauty, eternal joy. You know, I says, well, I couldn't really, you know, he's not a politician. We know politicians don't lie too much. <laughs> he's done the one, he'll do the other. And since the fall, man has naturally shut his ears to his maker. But God is making us holy. He's giving us desires that are in line with him. A.W. Tozer wrote this. Christians don't tell lies. Listen to this, I like this. Christians don't tell lies, they just go to church and sing them. <laughs> Think about your words when you sing. Here I am, Lord, all of me, you know, except for this, that, that, this, that, you know. A man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is so much like God. To waste your time, to waste your life is the greatest grievance to God and the greatest tragedy to man because we're made in his image and we settle for far less than things. God wants the whole person. He will not rest until he gets it entirely. You know, um, it, uh, all of these weights and encumbrances are things that we offload from unto, into Jesus Christ. And Satan uses all these things, amusement, fame, wealth, comfort, whatever it takes, to keep dying men, you and me, to keep dying men from knowing that they are dying. We're all dying. Do something about it. Do something about it. Don't hand God religion. Don't hand God good works. Hand God yourself, because he hands you himself, you see? God's going to be as pleased to see you in heaven as you will be to be there. Because he sees Jesus Christ. And so we tend by a secret law of our souls to move toward our mental image of God. And therefore the most important thing about a person is what they think about God. You see? 
what you think about God. This world is breaking under the weight of pride and pretense. Every person has the opportunity to choose his world. Now, I want you to remember that the Bible is a supernatural book, can only be understood by supernatural assistance, but the sons of this world refuse God to have only each other to look to uh, for assistance like frightened children. I think Spurgeon said that. So much religion today is not transforming people. Rather, the religion is transformed by the, by the people, tending to descend to the level of the entire culture around it and correct, congratulating itself that it has scored a victory because society is smilingly accepting its surrender. You see what he's saying here in a nutshell? When you adulterate the gospel, and you claim to be a Christian church, and you do anything to get bodies in the seats for whatever reason, human you know, pride, whatever situation, what, what you're doing is letting society transform the gospel. The gospel no longer transforms people. And then the church feels happy because, oh, now the world that hates Christ is smiling at our surrender. It's happening all over the place. It's sad. It's, it's devastation. Hardly anything else reveals so well the fear among men as to the length they will go to hide their true selves from one another. See, that's when we won't embrace the shame. That's when we look for approval. And so we start to kind of water things down so the world will smile at our surrender. We cannot love our enemies in our own strength. In every Christian's heart is a cross and a throne. And the Christian is on the throne until he puts himself on the cross. We insist on being saved, but we insist on Christ doing all the dying. We're not going to a party when it, when it comes to Christian life. We're going to a crucifixion. We insist on being saved, but we insist on Christ doing all the dying. If you continue to stymie the truths of this world, you, this word, you stymie the motions of life within you, and if you persisted in it, you may grieve the Holy Spirit in the silence. Do you like to talk to somebody about listening? Why do? And a lot of people do that. The widest thing in the universe is not space. It is the potential capacity of the human soul being made in the image of God, it is capable of unlimited, unlimited extension in all directions. And one of the worst tragedies in the world is that we allow our souls to shrink until there is only room left for me. Let's not be small-souled. Now here I close with this. And I think this is more on a national level for us because I... A uh, country has a soul too. There's a base belief system. There's a base desire. And I want to tell you that no, civil, no civilization will be greater than its idea of God. And we're in trouble. And we need to pray. And we need to vote. And we need to be informed. The cross stands high above the opinions of men. And all the opinions of men must eventually come to that cross that they judged to be judged. All the opinions of men must come to the cross to be judged, including us. Let's worship. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for your, your great wisdom and power and love. I pray that no one leaves here without knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. We're going to have uh, folks by the double doors here to pray for anybody who wants to come forward and pray. You can come forward doing our first song. We're going to do two songs. You can come down during the first song and pray with them over there. Tell them what's eating you. You know, whatever it is, your concerns, your worries. And then they'll give you lots of money. Uh, no. Uh, and, uh, um, while that's happening, the ushers are going to come down and they're going to take up an offering. And I pray, I pray, we need finances. Give. Give generously. You're never coerced, dear, to give. Never.
But we need, we need resources. We need resources. You want to keep these doors open? You like coming here? Give. That's the only way we'll survive. We want to continue this ministry. We need your help. So, Father, we place our whole selves into your presence. We offer our whole selves unto you. And we're thankful that we even have the privilege and the opportunity to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.